There you go. I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Tuesday, August 20th. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. We don't do prayers or buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity. And we may step on a few toes along the way. <laughs> but the real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We will take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us. And we do it all right here live from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But first, let me remind people that our, our audio streams on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com, and our video streams live on our Facebook group pages on Facebook Live. We take the audio of our show, we put it up as a podcast after the program. We take the video of the show, we put it up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. I encourage you to join, uh, subscribe to our podcast and, and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Look, we are still experiencing some internet issues here. So if you're watching us on Facebook Live, it can get a little bit choppy. We are working on some solutions and hopefully by the next broadcast, we, uh, we have some of that solved, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what the fix is. Uh, and how the fix works out. But um, I do encourage people to watch the show on YouTube if you're um, after the fact, because that's probably your your best viewing experience uh, until we get some of this internet stuff uh, solved. We don't have good internet on on the uh, on native territory, so that's that's part of the problem. So um, that's that's what we deal with. So anyway, um, I do want to say that uh, I am the host of the show, and I am joined in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our video and our sound. The best he can, considering what we're dealing with here. All right, before I get into anything else, I've got to uh, I got to make an announcement uh, I, and and uh, offer a wish. I wish my wife um, a happy 37th anniversary. It's not tonight, but it'll it'll be tomorrow. So uh, we will be celebrating our 37th year uh, anniversary tomorrow. So if you uh, catch Brenda, and you know she's posting uh, this show on all those Facebook group pages. So I'll reach out to her and tell her, uh, wish her a happy anniversary, uh, if you would. Um, all right. I got to do this show and, and kind of respond a little bit to the last show. Anybody who has somehow interpreted my suggestion that we shouldn't be voting in the elections of our oppressors as a suggestion that we do nothing, I never said that. I, I never even hinted that we should do nothing. I said voting in their elections is assimilation. I'm, and and look, that's it is. You, we you can say, well, that's your opinion, but there's no other way to describe it. If you become a part of their system, that's what assimilation is. That was the goal going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. I've you know, look, I've I've read his letters uh, to Henry Harrison, where he describes the idea of you know getting our land by offering us, you know, getting us in debt. So we'll lop off some of that debt with our lands so that once we get uh, surrounded by them, we will either become them or we'll move. Well, the fact that we are actually encouraging people on our territories where we, where we aren't being inundated with white people necessarily that we're, they're encouraging our people to vote in, in their elections. That's, that's problematic. And, uh, and that's assimilation. Just because I have suggested that we shouldn't vote in their elections, I'm not saying that we should just take their oppression and, and do nothing. I'm not saying be idle. I mean, I'm not saying be idle. I'm saying resist, stand up, fight back. So what I want to do with this show is I want to spend some time talking about the things that we can do, the things that we should do. And, you know, and, and, and I'm going to talk about some things that, that that our people are already doing, but I think we need to give it props and, and people need to understand that when we step up on missing and murdered indigenous women, I'm saying, let's step, let's step up and protect our women. Let's do the things that we, let's form our own systems of support. I'm not asking for, for a Congressman, you know, that we have to vote for to, um, to pass legislation to protect our women. I'm saying we need to protect our women. We need to protect our children. I don't need, you know, a, a stronger Indian Child Welfare Act. I'm saying we need some some things in our place. So when I say that we need to be active and that we need to be activists, I'm not saying we need to be lobbyists. That's 
We need less federal regulation. And we can't argue that the federal government has no right to legislate over us if we're asking them to legislate for us. If we're running out to vote for them, and then if we're saying, oh, we need to get some of our people on the inside, we need to get some of our people, you know, and fix it from within. When has that ever happened? When has it ever, and I'm not talking about Trojan horse where you sneak in on the inside and you, and you, and you sabotage it. No. When has it ever happened that we join the, the other team to, to what? Strengthen our position? I mean, when has it ever happened that we, that we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to fight them anymore. We're going to join them. And that's going to fix our problem. Then we're going to fix it from within. A tiny, tiny little bit of people compared to their population, we're going to vote for our own representatives and they're going to be beholden to us? I don't think so. But anyway, I do want to spend most of the show today talking about some of the good work that is being done that many of us aren't even participating in. Look, I know a a lot of people, you know, bought the t-shirts and the bumper stickers and they and they posted the memes on on facebook about standing with standing rock and i'm not i'm not belittling that at least that's something look you can be a bit of an activist even in social media you can do that at least do that but because i'll tell you if you go to the to their polls and you pull a lever you vote in their election they say there i've done it i did my responsibility to my people no you didn't even if you're a white person or a non-native person, and if you go into a voting booth and pull a lever and you cast a vote and you say, there, I've done my civic responsibility. I'm done for another two years or four years. Or if you feel like you elected somebody and now you're saying, well, that now it's his job. My work is done. All I had to do was to vote for him. Well, that's, look, if you're native, I, and I said this on, on, my, on my promo for the show, that's not just a sellout. That's a cop-out. That's like shirking any responsibility. Look, we have responsibilities. Everybody wants to talk about rights. You don't have rights without responsibilities. They go hand in hand. In fact, I would argue that we don't have rights, especially given to us by other men or other humans or other governments. The rights that we were given, were uh, the right to life, creation provided that, our parents or whatever you want to, however you want to interpret that. But the, the right to free speech, that's not the United, the United States didn't give me the right to speak. In fact, that's not even what the First Amendment says of their Constitution. You know what the First Amendment says? It doesn't say that, they, that they've given us the right to free speech. They said the right to free speech shall not be infringed upon. That's what it says. And it means by the government. They didn't give us the right. And, and, and somebody who picked up a rifle and, and put on a U.S. uniform and went to, you know, kill people in Afghanistan, they didn't fight for my right to free speech either. So let's stop all that nonsense. So if you vote, you didn't secure my right to speak. If you vote, you didn't secure my right to freedom and democracy. All that. No, that's all crap. So, and if you vote and you think that's your only job, look, there are people throughout history, who've done some remarkable things. And you know what? They weren't voted in. And they didn't do it through the, uh, through the political process. Martin Luther King, he wasn't elected. I mean, and, and, and you know, even if you don't want to you know, acknowledge the, the role he played as a, as a spiritual leader, just as, a, as an activist, he was just a man. Muhammad Ali, and I'm not talking about boxing. I'm talking about the stand on the on the on on the uh, the war in Vietnam. His role as an actor, he wasn't elected. Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, and we can I can we can list a bunch of native people, and I but I know that can get you know a little dicey. Some people have different views about folks, like you know certainly about Peltier or or you know Means or Banks or you know there are there are certain people that we know that are kind of you know. Uh, iconic. I mean, I, I'm much more of a fan of somebody like Vine Deloria, put it that way, or Louis Hall. But none of these people had to be elected. And in fact, I would argue that if these people did get elected into office or, or serve in the American or the Canadian system, I mean, <laughs> I had more respect for Murray Sinclair before he became a minister, you know, or whatever it is that he, the position that he has in Canada. You know, so, and we have our own systems besides that. 
we have our own politicians. We have our, you know, elected council or traditional council. But you know what? Just because somebody is sitting on a council, whether they're a chief or a councilman or a president, chairman, whatever the hell you want to call them, it doesn't mean that they that they alone have authority. You have the authority. You have the authority to to see to it that they do the right thing. But if you don't participate in your own government, then what the hell are you going voting in theirs for? We need to be active in our communities. I mean, if you don't go to go to your own council, if, if if these guys just operate in a vacuum because you don't bother going, and most people don't, unless they're giving stuff away, most people don't show up. They have no idea what's happening in a council session. And I'm, and I'm not just picking on Seneca Nation. Whether it's in a longhouse council or whether it's an elected council, most people have no idea because they don't participate in their own government. And and if your officials elected, you know, appointed, condoled, whatever you want to, however they got there, if they are closing the door on you, then you need to bust that door open. And I've said this before, the best way to prevent the abuse of authority is to not give it. Because most of those jobs, whether they're elected, you know, or, you know, or, or raised through traditional processes, those aren't positions of authority. Those, again, are positions of responsibility. And who are they responsible to? Us. But if we walk away, if we say, no, my job's done, that's not, that's not my job, that's somebody else's. That's, a, that's what I'm talking about when I say that's a cop-out. So first of all, first, look, the first responsibility that we have is to our family. The people that are closest, and that should be an easy one, right? We should make sure that we raise our kids properly. We should make sure that we do right by our by by our partners, our our wives, our you know our spouse, our, you know our our children, our our grandchildren. And this, you know what? That is still a part of decolonization because you know what the 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 colony says. They say that they that they have authority over, you know. Look, they try to they try to say they have authority over everything that we do. All aspects of our life try to suggest. Look, I, I know that we're experiencing some some difficulty here with the uh, with the feed. All I can say is, folks, if you're listening to us online um, and you want to watch the show, you're you're best off catching us on YouTube tomorrow because we are having uh, some major internet problems again in, in our facility here. So, uh, but anyway, but let, let me get back to it here. It is really important that we accept our responsibilities within our families, within our communities, within our nations, or our, our, you know, our, our larger territories. And we're, we accept the responsibilities that we have with each other, territory to territory, ungwe ungwe to ungwe ungwe, because we do have responsibilities. Missing and murdered indigenous women, I don't need more federal laws. Look, I would love to see the federal government acknowledge their role in, in what happens to our people. Just like uh, you know, trying to get Canada to do it. I mean, they do a, did a commission report and they call it genocide. Now all of a sudden, Canada's looking the other way. They don't. No, no, we, we don't accept the findings. We need to take control of the solutions to the problems that we have, and stop thinking that we're going to le- elect somebody. I had, I had a friend of mine says, "Oh, I'm so glad that uh, that um, Sharice David got got elected into Congress because she's uh, you know she's." You know, she's a lesbian. She's a, a member of the LGBT community, and we need a native LGBT activist in our uh, in in Congress to um, to help pass legislation. I said, for what? He says, well, because we have such problem we, uh, in our schools, and kids are bullied, and and this, and this guy was speaking about his his own firsthand problem. I said, what? That's you can't expect the federal government to to fix that problem. That's a local problem. Look, if we have problems on uh, on our territories here in Cattaraugus. Do we? Do you honestly think somebody's going to pass some piece of legislation in Albany or, or, or Washington D.C. that's going to fix our problem here? Hell, most of the time they are part of the problem. Our problem isn't the lack of federal uh, oversight on the problems that we face. Our problems are usually associated with the federal government involved in our businesses, in, or in, in our lives. They are more. And I know this is kind of one of those things that Republicans always say, oh, the biggest problem with government is big government. Look, this isn't a Republican talking point. This is a native talking point associated with with our own distinction and autonomy. So what are the things that we need to do? Like I said, it starts with our family. I mean, if we can't basically be responsible to the people that we see every freaking day, 
then what do we think is going to happen when you pull a lever to vote for somebody? Do you think they're going to they're going to give a rat's ass about you? You've got to care for your children. You've got to care for your family. And you know what? Who are the next closest people to you? Your neighbors. If you don't even know the people that live next to you, if you're not willing to help somebody shovel a driveway, plow a driveway, you know, uh, you know, mow a lawn. I mean, do some damn thing to help somebody that's that's your neighbor. At least be courteous. And courteous. If you see somebody struggling with something, look. This doesn't sound like you know earth shattering. You know, uh, you know, um, uh, resistance. And it isn't just resistance. Our lives isn't uh, is shouldn't just be built about resisting them. It should be about building us up, building us, supporting each other, supporting our own people. That is the task. That is our responsibility. So it starts with our family, then it starts with our, with our closest neighbors, and then the, the larger community. And, and, and again, we can talk about nations, if that's, what, if that's the word you use, if you are your peoples. And then we start reaching across. And we realize that there's something, oh, maybe we can help somebody in Tuscarora. Maybe we can help somebody in, in Tonawanda. Maybe we can help somebody in Gunawaga or Akwesasne. Maybe we can help our friends in Lakota territory. In, in Hopi territory, the Ney territory, in the, in, uh, in the southeast, the southwest, the northwest. There are things that we can do, not just trade and commerce, but let's not leave trade and commerce out of it. If we want to decolonize, the first thing we have to do is accept, responsibility, accept the responsibilities for our own problems. And I know people are going to say, well, that's the financial issues and we don't have the money, resources. To do that. You know what? That's a lot of crap, too. There's plenty of native. There's plenty of money in, in native territories, and you know what? There's plenty, plenty of help that comes from other places other than Canada and the United States too. But we've got to do the things right. There, there's uh, look. We can look across native territories and see plenty of income disparity too. I mean, and I'm not just saying well, because there's the gaming, the rich gaming tribes, and then there's the, then there's the the dirt poor, you know, tribes that have nothing. No, it, 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 it's some of that, but it's not all of that. There's money around. But I'll tell you, where some of the resistance comes from uh, that, that I talk about is we got to resist being fleeced from, from, the, uh, from the state and the federal government. We're still being hit with all kinds of taxes on the federal level, and we're being hit by taxes on the, on the state level. Everyone's saying, oh, yeah, Native people, they don't pay taxes. Well, I don't know what the hell you call a billion and a half dollars going to New York State over gaming. That sure as hell wasn't something they paid. They, they got something of value for. That's a tax. So we have to fight those things. So when somebody asks me, oh, you're just advocating doing nothing. I don't do nothing. I do things. I, I, I'm, a, I'm an activist. So that means I fight back. And sometimes I fight back with the pen. Sometimes I do it with the computer. Sometimes I do it over the air with, with, with what I'm doing here. But I have been to Washington and I've been to Albany and I put, I've drawn the lines in the sand. I've gotten movement in places that people didn't think you'd get movement. I, I, look, I talked about going to meet uh, meet at the White House. I've I've gone to the Capitol. I've met with state senators, and and even people I don't necessarily care for, like Andrew Cuomo. I mean, th this guy needs a talking to because you know what? He can talk about you know how racist the Godfather is because it stereotypes Italians. What the hell do you think he's doing when he makes a statement like, "Oh, the Senecas uh, have a history of make of, of breaking agreements." I had somebody posted, what the hell was he doing during history class? Was he sleeping? So, no, we have, we have to confront these issues. We have to educate ourselves, and we have to educate others. Now, that's part of what I do. But we all have a responsibility in that. And I'm not saying the first thing you need to do is watch my show. Well, that's, you could do that. That's one place to start. But you know what? It goes beyond that. Pick up a freaking book. Learn, I mean, see what's happening in the world. If you can't look at what's happening in Palestine and see a connection to what's happened to our people, if you're just going to take the talking points that come from the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, over things like Venezuela or Cuba or, you know, or Israel, if you can't, you know, provide your own or use your own mind to, to, to provide critical thinking to the problems that other people are facing and realize, oh, that's a similar problem that we have. If you can't look at other oppressed groups, whether it's the LGBT community, whether it's uh, women, whether it's, you know, uh, immigrants or, or refugees or, um, you know, 
people of you know of marginalized you know uh you know faith practices or whatever else if you can't see people who are being oppressed and then find some common ground with some of those people because i'm not saying that we have to stay the tiny minute marginalized people fighting the giants around us i'm saying yeah we need to find allies we i mean that's why i support the the, the work of somebody like colin kaepernick oh and i supported the work of of, of people like Muhammad Ali. Not because of, of a special kinship that I have with it, because what they were fighting for is the same damn thing that, that we should be fighting for. And if we're not, if all we're going to say is, oh, yeah, no, I voted. Yeah, I, I did that. Now, now it's somebody else's job. I, that, that's bullshit. I'm sorry. We have responsibility. And because when I look... When I look at even some of these so-called iconic leaders and I realize how much they ran around on their wives, how much they left their children to, to defend for themselves, that's not a leader. So when, when I listen to, to some of these people telling me that we have to go vote for, for who? The next white person who's going to oppress us? Andrew Cuomo is a Democrat. Barack Obama is a Democrat. He was the one responsible for the Dakota Access Pipeline, not Donald Trump. Donald Trump just finished the damn thing. Hillary Clinton was in favor of that. Heidi Heitkamp. So all, all of this, a lot of this conversation began because I was saying that the North Dakota courts or the, the U.S. courts upheld North Dakota's uh, uh, policy of, of not allowing somebody, uh, uh, approving somebody's voter registration form if they didn't put their physical address down. That's fine. We shouldn't be voting in their elections anyway. Who are you going to vote for? And then, and so I got into it with a, with a few people. Well, we've got a couple of native candidates. Well, for, for one thing, even if you get a native candidate representing some little small district that is primary, pr primarily native, you better look at the rest of your freaking state. Because not only do you, do you stand a, a snowball's chance in hell of getting a congressman elected, you sure as hell are never going to get a senator elected. We don't have a not large enough population to turn a red state blue. And you know what? The blue states <laughs> oppress us in many of uh, the same ways the red states do anyway. We're, we're, we're in Cataraugus. We got New York State all around us. And you know what we got? We got Republicans and Democrats uh, all, all around us. And you know, they don't, they still to this day will refuse to acknowledge our distinction. They, they think that we're just one of them. Eh, maybe a little different. Yeah, they think that we're just a special interest group, not a distinct people. And and if you think that we can that that through voter registration we can become some significant special interest group, you're play, you're kidding yourself. You're fooling yourself. You know what special interest groups have? Money. That's how they affect policy. Do you think righteousness has a role in this thing? Forget about that. It doesn't. This isn't about right and wrong it's about right and left a little bit but it's more about white and brown white and not white i mean the, the political process is is controlled still and and almost desperately so by uh by the the white majority and so you look at these states where native people are struggling the most most of them are, are Republican strongholds. Do you think you, you think getting somebody elected, or, or or whether they're native or either they're they're you think they're a, you're going to vote for a white ally? What, what like Heidi Heitkamp? Yeah, yeah. She she blew all kinds of smoke up her ass as uh, uh you know in in North Dakota as she was uh, as she was supporting um, Keystone XL pipeline supporting. The Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, all kinds of pipelines supporting, you know, um, uh, extractive industries, the Bakken crude, all, you know, all this stuff. So where are these people that you think are going to champion our causes that, 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 that we're going to elect and be able to sit back and say, all right, we elected somebody. Our work is done here. No, it isn't going to happen. Look, do I have some preferences on who I hope? wins an election sure i do because i know that I, i'm not living in, in, a, in a fantasy world where i think that the, that the things that these people do don't affect us that's why i've been to albany that's why i've been to washington that's why i've i've, I've sat in in the uh, the offices of congressmen and senators 
But what, I didn't go in there with my hat in my hand and say, please, will you piece of, pass a piece of legislation? I actually co-authored, or, or wrote the draft for a letter that came from a Republican and a Democratic state, uh, state senator demanding that the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance state their policy on native-to-native trade and native brands of tobacco products. I mean, I didn't, wasn't elected to do that. You know, and you, you know who hired me to do that? Nobody. It was a question that needed to be answered, and it still didn't get answered. But, you know, I got two senators on the line for it. And, and as a result of that, that kind of pushback, did, did it change a law? No, it didn't change a law. But it sure did start to change you know, how, how much um, friction we're getting. Now, I'm not saying, you know, friends like Eric White have, you know, haven't run into, into trouble on, over the road. But it's the exception to the rule when it happens. And part of the reason it happens is because I was only one voice doing that. Where's everybody else? You want to fix the missing and murdered indigenous women's issue? The, it starts by respecting the women in our communities. We need to provide prospects for the future for our children, young boys and young women. We need to provide hope and not just hope, false hope. We need to provide opportunities. We need to, we need to empower people in our, in our communities. But we, if we're not even empowering ourselves, if we're saying, no, we, we just need to vote somebody for somebody else to do it, that's not empowerment. That's disempowerment. That's the opposite of empowerment. What we need to do, when we talk about decolonization, I've said this before, decolonization is not about finding comfortable places within the systems of oppression. It's not. It's about dismantling those systems or at very least untangling ourselves from them. Less CPS, less cops, less courts, less congressmen, less senators, less presidents, less governors. We need them out of our lives. Those are the systems of oppression we need to untangle ourselves from. We need, look, if you've got a, a, you know, a president of your nation, a, chair, a tribal chairman, a chief, if you've got these things, you already have somebody. And, you know, and if that person isn't a skilled diplomat, then replace him. Get somebody who is. Get somebody who can, who can stand, uh, uh, step, step up to a podium and speak strongly about issues. Let's rally our people to do things. I don't mean just to go protest someplace, but perhaps that too. But if we don't empower ourselves to do things like feed ourselves, shelter ourselves, nurture ourselves, if we're not doing those things, then we aren't decolonizing. All right, we're at the bottom of the hour. We'll take a break and we'll come back. Hopefully the internet stays with us. Strong enough through the rest of the show, but we'll see how it goes. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. We'll be right back.
be idle anymore not voting is not isn't the same as being idle folks just again i can't i can't emphasize that enough all right let me uh let me thank my sponsors i want to thank uh ross and holly john and the rje family of businesses eric white and the rw enterprises and my anonymous sponsors as well and those who will on occasion drop a check in the mail and uh, help us build out our studio build out our capability a little bit piece by piece um i, I again i appreciate the support i appreciate the support that i get from those who comment and, and listen to the show and engage in the conversation, not just during the show, but I mean, even some of the debates that I've had on Facebook, I don't mind somebody trying to hold me to task and calling me out on, you know, suggesting that I'm, I'm saying we should do nothing because that's not what I said. But look, I, even in New York, when, when I start taking calls uh, on our, on our, call, our listener line, when I get some racist that calls in, I don't mind him calling in because he, he allows me the opportunity to, to explain things in further detail and to actually confront the racism directly on, on a live show. That's, you know, that's always, that's always, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, an, it's kind of exciting to do that because you realize that this is what we're facing. So um, again, I want to thank all of you who, who, who do call in and engage and, and who do engage me on Facebook and, and, you know, and look, I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, uh, share the shows. Um, and and again, by all means, call me out. You know, call me out and uh, and 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 engage me. Because if I say something that is it can be interpreted in such a way that um, that that makes somebody indifferent, then then let me explain it further. Perhaps perhaps it's not uh, you know coming through clearly. I mean, look, I I talk a lot. I'm not saying I always talk well. <laughs> so uh, let, let's give it a give it a crack. Look, here's the thing. We better understand that the world's a big place and there's a lot of stuff going on that's beyond our control on the, you know, on both the global level and as far as the United States goes, their nation, Canada, these, we don't have a whole lot of say in what the United States does, what Canada does, what Europe does. We, and we never will. You can vote all you want. You can pray all you want. It's not going to affect, but I'll tell you, climate change is real. And it's going to have devastating effects to lots of people. And, you know, look, and if you're in a place that you say, well, I'm in a pretty good spot for climate change. I'm uh, elevated. I don't have to worry about seas rising. I, you know, I'm in an area that's got a lot of fresh water. We live near the Great Lakes. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Or, you know, the, if anything, the, you know, the, the, the climate is becoming more moderate. So, oh, I'm in good shape. Well, I'll tell you what, if you are a marginalized people and you're sitting on, uh, on the, what becomes the most valuable property, you don't think you're going to be facing some, uh, you know, some threats from the outside, you're damn sure going to be. It's not going to just be climate change. Climate change will make people ugly because it'll make people desperate. And look, we see, oh, before I get in, in, into all of the desperation, but so climate change is real. And it's, and, and it, it is, it, it is not just the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It is, it's the, it's the 8,000 pound gorilla in the room. This is what's going to affect us. Now, the economy, Look, you know, a lot of this debate over, you know, presidential nominees and everything else, it's all about, you know, how how's the economy doing? Well, Trump's doing great because econ the economy is great. Well, I'll tell you, it ain't so great. The economy is great for uh, for a relatively small group of people, the 1%. They're doing really, really well. 
And when, when Trump st- brags, oh, I've got, you know, black unemployment at the lowest levels ever. Well, he, you may have this number that people talk about, this unemployment rate down low, which is not a true unemployment rate. It is just somebody who's filed for unemployment in three months. I mean, you want to talk about unemployment rates? You give me the total number of jobs held by people versus the population. That'll give you a, a, an unemployment rate, not what they're throwing out there as an empl- unemployment rate. But even if you're going to say, okay, but the number is what it is, and it's a lower rate. But income disparity is at an all-time high. So if black people are doing so well under, uh, under Donald Trump, then why is the income disparity widening? Because it isn't doing, doing so well. This economy is at a tipping point. Climate change can actually even affect it, but certainly geopolitical issues, you know, tariffs and Brexit, all kinds of other things. If this economy crashes, we better have a plan. If, if climate continues to have devastating effects, we better know how to grow food. We better know, we better be more prepared because I'll tell you, when you take out your ATM card and you go to the, go to the bank and all of a sudden it doesn't spit out the money that you think you have in there, that's going to be a shocker, folks. So if you don't have any other plan B, if the only plan you have is, is truth, justice, and the American way, well, you better prepare for that stuff to collapse. Because those two things, climate, look, we passed the tipping point a long time ago on that. And we probably passed the tipping point on, on what's going to be an economic collapse. But the two other big issues that, that we face, and I talked about this before, social unrest, White people, as they get desperate and scared, why do you think people are shooting, the, are shooting up schools, churches, synagogues, Walmart? Do you think that's a brave act? No, that's a desperate act. And look, it's only a few people, right? There's just a few people, the, the, the lunatic fringe on the right. They may be the lunatic fringe on the right, but there's a whole lot of people still on the right with them. So social unrest, racial tensions, you know, all of this, uh, you know, this oppression that, that marginalized people, and, and, I, and I went through the list earlier uh, of all the marginalized people who are facing some, some sort of oppression from, you know, from, for either from other groups or adjacent groups, other, other people that, that are just frankly, they're glad they're not them. At least I'm not gay. At least I'm not black. At least I'm not Jewish. Anytime you hear that word, at least, you're going to hear something really terrible that comes after that. So social unrest, it has the potential to be, have devastating effects, not just on urban environments. Look, I can drive only a few miles down the road and there's a house with a Nazi flag and a, and a Confederate flag hanging on it right there, right, right in Silver Creek, next town over. And that's not the only one. That's just the one that, that everybody sees. And yeah, most, anybody who lives around here knows who I'm talking about, knows the house that I'm talking about. So this kind of hate symbolism is out there. I can drive right in the town. I can, I can probably find at least a dozen Confederate flags flying within a few, uh, you know, within a few mile radius of here, right here. You know, you go to a, if you go to a powwow, you'll see Confederate flags being, being sold at one of the powwow booths. I, I saw that posted again this year. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that, that is out there. So... Social unrest is a real thing. And of course, the other thing is, isn't just a social unrest, but it's, but it's kind of related to it. War. Look, there is violence happening all over the world. And the, and the threat of violence. I mean, look, you've got, you know, a nuclear arms race, you know, uh, getting kickstarted again. You've got, you know, threats against, uh, you know, for regime change in, in you know, whether it's, you know, Iran or whether it's uh, Venezuela or, you know, or, or you know, other, you know, it's, it's all over the world. And the United States is at the center of it. So we got war, social unrest, economic collapse, and climate change. Now, having said all that, that doesn't mean the world's coming to an end. But it might for some people. So these, again, these are, these are some of the questions. Do you think you're going to vote your way out of this? Honestly? You think you're going to vote your way out of that or pray your way out? Well, good luck with that because some of you may think that's the all you have left. So when somebody accuses me of saying, well, you're just suggesting doing nothing. No, if all you're suggesting is prayer and votes, 
you're suggesting nothing. I'm saying we need to do something. We need to do things at multiple levels. We need to do it at the local level. Again, starts with family. But as Native people, and I'm not saying that we need to, you know, just dismiss every person that's not Native. But if we can lead by example and talk about the things that we need to do to be proactive, we're not going to stop climate change. And we're not going to stop an economic, uh, economic collapse. And we're not going to solve the social unrest issues. But we can, be a, we can be a good example. And we certainly can keep that stuff at bay from our communities. Because we don't have to be affected by all that stuff. I mean, I'm not saying the, the, you know, there isn't going to be some effect. But it doesn't have to be debilita debilitating to us. But if we don't step up, if we don't stand up, as Murray says in the song, if we remain idle, and I consider pulling a lever in their elections as, as idle as it gets, you might think you did some heroic thing by stepping up and voting in their elections. Well, not all of us think that way. But, you know, even if you do that, look, to those people who, who I've been debating uh, um, over the last few days over this issue, we are still on the same side. Even though you're kind of ju you're jumping on the other team, at the end of the day, even all you Native people who think you need to vote for a Democrat or Republican, maybe you're a Trump worshiper, I don't know, there's still a part of you that says, but I'm Native. So there's the, there, I still have common ground with you, even if politically, strategically, you know, um, even if you're, you know, a devout Christian, a Mormon, a Calvinist, or whatever the hell else you are, Jewish, whatever, whatever you, you, you believe in, if you're native, you still have a, a, there's still a piece of you that, that I'm, that I'm aligned with. So I still have common ground with you. We're not complete. We aren't enemies. You may be, you know, converting with, you know, <laughs> with, you know, um, with the enemy, you may, you may be associating with the enemy in ways that concern me. But I, but I said this, you know, I said this earlier. At some point, we come to the conclusion that neither our votes nor our prayers solve the problem. So we, we all have to return back. We have to come back and we have to say, I guess all I have is the people closest to me, my family, my community, my, you know, my fellow people. We don't have to wait till the bottom drops out to get there, though, folks. We can do this now. We can stand up. Look, we should have, and I, and I said this before, when, uh, part of my condemnation about, you know, lawyers, lobbyists, consultants, you know, you know PR companies and all of those that, that, that all of these tribes hire. We should be doing that work. I don't mean just me, but we, we all should play a role. And I've seen it. Look, I saw people step up in this community to, to fight um, uh, counter sport, uh, their um, waste management or their, their um, water treatment facility that was going to take fracking fluid. I saw pe uh, fracking, fracking water, I should say. I saw people in this community step up and they weren't elected to do it. I mean, and there were some elected people that were involved, but they weren't the leaders there. I saw people in Standing Rock. I've seen people on uh, you know, Line 9. I've seen people in, at Caledonia. I've seen people in Gunawaga and Gunazadaga. And I've seen people in, uh, you know, uh, you know at, at, at Mauna Kea. They aren't the elected officials that are, that are offering this resistance. It's people just like, just like us. But the more of us that step up, the more of us that protect and resist the more of us that do something means the, the fewer of us that have to do it all. But if you think you can just vote for somebody and th that it's their job, the likelihood is you're not going to be happy with what they do. Again, the best way to prevent the abuse of authority is to not give it. You don't have to give up all your... I mean, when we talk about the word sovereignty, and I'm not a big fan of the word because sovereignty oftentimes is more associated with power than, than rights, I guess. But when, when you look political from a political science standpoint, if you ask, where is sovereignty vested in the various isms, you know, so in, in, a, in a democracy, where is sovereignty vested? Well, in a democracy, 
sovereignty is a the power of the of the of the masses, the people, as they come together. Now, in what what people call a republic, sovereignty is vested in the individual. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what we are, but in our culture, we we look at the power to carry the, the power and the right to carry ourselves as something that doesn't come from a government or a constitution or a Bible. It comes from creation. If, 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 if something exists in creation, then it has a right to exist. I mean, it, it, it seems like, you know, almost too, too obvious, but, and, I, and I'm not saying creation doesn't uh, create things that we don't understand the purpose for them. You know, people still wonder, what, what's, the, what's the function of a mosquito other than to spread diseases? Well, it does have function. <laughs> we don't understand it all. And, you know, and that's, that's the thing about knowledge. Knowledge isn't just the idea of, of, of learning all you can learn. There's a humble part of knowledge that says, you know, there's some things I may not ever understand. In our culture, when we talk about the power of creation, in our culture, what we say is, we will not know the name or the face of the place that the power dwells. But we will know of the evidence of that power. That is what creation is. The power of creation, we may not, we may not ever understand that. But creation is all around us. So, so we see it, we experience it. And our responsibility is to respect what has been created. Now, we have done some things, some terrible things with what creation has provided us. And out of those terrible things, we have caused disease. Evil doesn't exist in, in nature by itself. Evil is a man-made construct. Many things in nature are, are neither good nor, nor evil. I'm not saying things aren't beautiful or attractive or, or, may, or maybe scary. I mean, there are a lot of things in, in, you know, any a full range of emotions can be elicited from everything that creation has provided. But the true, but the, that sense of, of evil, that's a man-made thing. Evil lurks in the heart of man, not in the heart of the wolf, you know, or, or frankly, even, even in, 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 the, in, the, in the cells of cancer. Now, look, we know that disease can be debilitating. But much of the disease that we face has come as a result of the actions of man. We, we've, we've contaminated the waters. We've contaminated the air. We've, you know, we, we've contaminated our food supply. Now, I'm not saying there that's what you get. I'm not, I'm, I'm not you know, look, I, I, have, I have friends today, one of my dearest friends, who is battling cancer today. And, and, uh, and, and to me, cancer is the enemy. But I also know that we're somewhat responsible for it. And what we've done to, you know, to, our, to our, our health. I get back to the, again, when, when we talk about decolonization, some of it comes back to food sovereignty. How do we control what we eat more? The power, you know, again, sovereignty is about power, right? The, the, the power to feed ourselves. We've farmed that out. We've let Walmart provide that for us now. We better take some of control of that. And, and, and that's kind of the movement. That's one of the movements. And so when people ask, well, what can we do? If not vote, what can we do? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. Again, food. Shelter, nurturing. That's all part of life, for all of life. So what is our role in that? Uh, nurturing is a big one, right? I mean, security, you know, warmth, education. We have, there is room for everybody to do something that they're not doing right now. Now, if you've got a pretty full life, you probably, there's probably still something more that you can do. And, and these things have rewards. I don't mean cash rewards. Look, what I do here is, um, I mean, I, how do you measure success? I mean, am I successful at what I do? I, I don't know. I mean, that's for somebody else to decide, I guess. 
But what I, what I try to do with Let's Talk Native and my show in New York is to encourage critical thinking, encourage a conversation, because that's the first step to action. No, it's easy. When people would say, well, all you do is talk. Well, people don't know what I do when I'm not talking. I don't do just, I don't just talk. I help people, whether it's fixing a car or whether it's, you know, um, taking care of somebody's kids or giving somebody a ride someplace. I mean, some of the most basic things, but we all need to reach out and do more for each other. That's the first step in decolonization. The first step of decolonization is stop relying on the colonial powers. And start relying on ourselves, on our own autonomy, our own distinction. I know these sound like really simple things. And they are simple things. But they are simple things that, that far too many of us aren't doing. Stand up, resist, have a conversation. I mean, you know, they, they keep doing this polling, right, about the Washington football team. And time and time again, they, you know, they'll do some basic, where they just call a bunch of phone numbers. Then they'll ask the person on the other end of the phone, are, are you native? So some self-reporting person who says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm native. I'm, uh, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess, of course, right? And I, and, uh, and I find, uh, I don't find the Washington Redskins offensive. So we get these polling results that, that say 80% of native people polled support the Washington Reds. Well, where are all the voices? Where are all our commentaries? Where are all the voices that we need to bring in on social justice issues? I don't mean just mascot issues, but I mean on issues, you know, associated with environment. Why aren't we all stepping up to, to stop the, the pipeline that goes through our territories? Why aren't we coming up with better solutions? How many solar roofs do you see uh, on, on homes in native territories? That's all something that we can play a role in. How many gardens do you see? When I was a kid growing up, every house had a garden. Every house doesn't have a garden now. What is your symbol of resistance? Look, it doesn't have to be the unity flag, but let it be the Hiawatha belt. Let it be the two-row wampum. Do something. Uh, show, don't just get a tattoo. Live some of these things. Understand what some of these things, understand your culture. Learn your language. Learn what it means to counsel. Understand what, what it means to, to, to you know, what, what the fire represents in, in your families, in your communities, in your, in your nations. Learn one story and tell that story over and over again. That's decolonization. Decolonization isn't just handing your, your, your kid a Dick Jane and Sally book or a Dr. Seuss book. And I'm not saying I don't want anything against Dr. Seuss. But what about our stories? Write a children's book. Do a video. Sing a song. Entertain. Provide native entertainment to our, uh, to our people. Let's engage. Educate. Entertain. Um, inform. And, and don't look for the heroes out there. You know, I, I, somebody asked me that when I was in New York, says, well, do you guys have anybody uh, in your history who's like, um, um, you know, like, like or talking about me as, as a Mohawk, like Red Cloud, for instance, they said. And, and I had to explain, in our culture, we don't do that. We don't really prop up heroes in our community. We tell a story that, that can be somewhat generic. I, you know, a number of years ago, somebody told me they were trying to put funding together. They wanted to create a native hall of fame. They wanted to do a museum that was going to list all of the most famous native people in our history. No, you weren't. You were going to create the most famous native people in your history. That's what they were going to do because that's not our way. I mean, you think about in history, people think about Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Geronimo. Well, what about anybody before that? It's not like we don't have memories and we didn't have language. Yeah, we didn't write history books necessarily. So why didn't we, you know why they're famous? Because white people made them famous. And I'm not saying they weren't good men, but we've had good men for thousands and thousands of years and women. And you know what? Our stories talk about the women as much as they do the men. 
But if you look at those historical figures, unless, Wilma Mankiller is the only native person somebody can come up with. But we don't, that's, we don't have to follow their way in anything, whether it's regulatory issues, whether it's crime and punishment, whether it's justice, whether it's education, whether it's economy. We can find our own way. That's decolonization. And that's not being idle. That's not doing nothing. Look, I want to thank you guys for listening. We'll keep going on some of these subjects. And obviously, we are entering that silly season. And I'll tell you, one thing I got to say, if you don't think that voting puts you on the other side, all you got to do is witness some of the conversations I've had this week and, and how strongly opposed those people who vote are with those of us who won't. The fact that they're fighting me this strongly shows me the side that they're on. And that should, t that should show you something as well. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Yahweh. So calm to me Blood in the water It comes so naturally It's a gift from my mother Yeah.